I'm going to continue to talk about supernatural love because this is a love that most believers aren't walking in today. Uh, I want to walk in it more and more. Uh, there's some that walk in it more than others. But we primarily tend to walk in the DNA structure of our earthly parents. But when you're born again, you come into a new family. You come into the family that is of a kingdom, a different kingdom, a kingdom that's not of this world, but a kingdom that is a heavenly kingdom. We spend so much time trying to get out of here and go somewhere else that we never think about bringing the kingdom of God into the earth, which is what God wants to do. As a matter of fact, Matthew 6.10, Jesus talked about it he released not only a prayer but a strategy of the kingdom when he said you pray this way you decree kingdom of God come will of God be done in earth as it is in heaven that's what I call heavenizing the earth and so I have spent many many years seeking to heavenize the earth but God's now saying to me I want you to get heavenized also and I want the people that you minister to to get heavenized as well. I want them not to look like the people in the earth. I want them to look like heaven living among the people in the earth. And so we have been sent tonight, each one of us, by God. We are heavenly people. Say heavenly people. So for two years the Lord has been telling me that He is bringing to the body of Christ a supernatural love. It's not an earthly love. It's not a love that your parents gave you. It's a love that God gives when you were born into the kingdom and into the family. And so he bestows that love upon us. And then on, on October the 12th of this year, the Lord wrapped me for three hours in his supernatural love and began downloading me to how he wants to love us and lavish his love upon us. To the point that he lavishes that love upon us that we in turn are able to lavish that love on other people also. And what I found fascinating as I begin studying all this, when you get to Luke 6 chapter, you'll find the Lord says out of the Passion Translation, he makes a statement there. He says the Lord is even quick because of his mercy to heal even the unthankful and the cruel. And when I read this, it was an eye-opener for me that I do not care to spend time with the unthankful and the cruel. But the Bible says that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Most of all, us are friends to people who like us, and we like them. Or love us, and we love them. But we've never thought about being a friend to sinners because we've gotten so self-righteous that we would not hang around a sinner because they curse and take the Lord's name in vain. And do those kind of things that really hurts our ears. But you have to remember this. And, and we also think this way. Because I feel this way, this must be the way God feels. But He doesn't. He doesn't feel that way at all. As a matter of fact, He's quick to heal the unthankful and even those who take His name in vain. And so, I've spent many years teaching out of 1 Corinthians 12, especially when I teach about the apostolic, or teach about the spiritual gifts, or teach out of 1 Corinthians 14, and teach about the gift of tongues and how it's to operate. But I've not spent a whole lot of time in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter, Except when you want to feel squishy or something like that. But I was reading just recently in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, out of the Passion Translation. I'm going to read it to you. But you should all constantly boil over with passion in seeking the higher gifts. Woo! That's exciting. Now, he told us to seek right here. He said, I want you to seek these gifts. I want you to seek after the gift. Say, seek after the gift. There's nothing wrong with seeking after the gift. People say you shouldn't seek the gift. You should seek the giver. You can't separate the gift from the giver. They're one and the same. But then in the latter part of that verse, put it back up there, please. 
He says, and now I show you a superior way to live that is beyond comparison. New, New King Tran, uh, James translation says that I show you a more excellent way. All the gifts and all the other stuff doesn't operate as well when we're only walking in a human type of love. And God has caused me to get real transparent here lately with myself and with others. Confessing my sins, confessing my faults. We have forsaken a doctrine in the scripture. We would never do this anymore that says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is one place that the Catholics got it right. Because they will go and confess their sins to the priest on Friday. And then go and sin the rest of the week. <laughs> Until Friday. But sandwiched right in between these two chapters of the, are the gifts of the Spirit. Is a chapter on agape. And uncompromising. Unconditional love. That our Father has for everybody in the world. Well, I've taught this chapter, I must confess, I've not really walked in the fullness of it. And in honesty, neither have most of you. If you say that you have, then we will cast some lying demons out of you later. This love that Paul is speaking of is a supernatural in nature. Through the years, my focus has primarily been on either chapter 12 or 14. And I will continue to teach on the apostolic, continue to teach on the gifts of the Spirit. But this verse that we just read above points out that we are to pursue with passion these gifts. But inserts, adds, hello Natasha. We're so delighted you're here, sweetheart. But inserts that there is a more superior way of walking with Christ and that way is... The agape, unconditional, undeserving, uncompromising love that the Father gives to us. So, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, we used to sing this song back in the charismatic days. How many of you remember this song? One, two, three. You may sing it for you remember it? And you weren't even charismatic days. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. But he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, First John 4, 7 and 8. And then you start it again. <laughs> One of the things about the charismatic days, we sang scripture songs. And we got the word of God hammered on the inside of us through doing that. We're going to read it out of the New American Standard. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. But this, the love of God, was manifested in us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now grab hold of this. Being born of God means that Yahweh is your Father. When Jesus used the term born again, he talked about a man or a woman being born out of blood and water. But then he talked about another birth. And that is the birth into another kingdom. As a matter of fact, he talks about that if a man is not born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
But when someone is born again, they're born of the Father. They come into a new kingdom. They are in a new family. They're not in an old family. You're no longer uh, operating in the family of sin and death. You're not on, no longer supposed to operate in the traits of your natural daddy or the traits of your natural mother. You're to operate in the traits of our Heavenly Father. And I've shared this with you already, but I'll share it again tonight because there's some who have not heard it. When I start walking in the flesh, my wife is quick to point out to me that you're acting just like your dad. And she doesn't have to say that but one time until I start repenting. Because I know what he acted like. And I'll have to say to her, yeah, you're right. I'm in a new family, and so I repent of whatever reason I'm walking that way. I repent of that real quickly, jump back into the family of God, jump back into my true lineage, into my true heritage, and begin walking as a son and not as an orphan. That's a good word, Brother Ken. You should just keep preaching that. Thank you very much, I will. See, it means that Yahweh is our Father, and we've been born into a new family. Within us, the DNA of Christ flows in us. We have His DNA on inside, inside of us. Not only do we have His DNA, we are in His image. He said in Genesis 1, 26, He said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He goes on to say, and let's give them dominion. Say dominion. So we have, listen to this, we have dominion over the old image that our parents gave to us. We now have dominion to walk in the image of Christ, to act like Christ, walk like Christ, talk like Christ, and be be like Christ in the earth. It's a good word. And when we walk and talk like that, all of a sudden Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. Love is shed abroad in our hearts to the point that everyone around us is experiencing Christ. Because He's in us. They begin to experience Him through us. Jesus put us on this earth to be His ambassadors. We represent another kingdom. We represent Him in the earth. Don't represent ourselves. This is a good word here. Grab this and run with it. And repent. Repent from walking in the flesh. The DNA of Christ flows in us. We are in the image of the Father, His Son, and the Holy Ghost. This DNA that we have is heavenly and not earthly. This DNA is full of joy. You should have been on this train with us and saw all the crazy people that were on there acting so full of joy, dancing around, doing glory train marches. I almost said to Tangie tonight, I said, let's do a glory train march. You thought the same thing, Sandy? Why didn't you take off? (laughs) He wants us to be full of joy. Not full of the earth or full of the devil. He wants us to have his joy on the inside of us. That DNA within us is also in his likeness. Not in my daddy's likeness. My daddy didn't walk in this DNA. My mama, when she was raising me, didn't walk in this DNA. But we now have taken on a new DNA. It is the DNA structure of Jesus Christ. We are heavenly people. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, say born again, there's that word. Born again, not of corruptible seed, that's what your daddy had, that's what your mom had, But incorruptible. We've been born of an incorruptible seed. It's not tainted with sin. It's not tainted with sickness. It's not tainted with disease. We've been born of incorruptible seed through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. 
You see, this corruptible seed, we've inherited through the generations all the way back to Adam. But now we have a, this, this corruptible seed is a human seed of sin. And in that seed are the fruits of the flesh. As I shared with you last week, you don't have to teach a baby how to say no. That's one of the first words they learn on their own. No. Y'all remember those little kids saying that? You remember them saying that? Yeah. Did you teach them to say no? I didn't think you did. We, none of you did. But they learned that very quickly, even though you didn't teach them to say that, because of the seed that was sown out of Adam. When they're born again, when all of us are born again, the seed changes. A new residence takes up in us. And that's the residence of the Holy Ghost living on the inside of us. We are His temple. When the Bible talks about that we're the temple of the Holy Ghost, it literally translated as being the palace of the Holy Ghost. That's a good word there. You are the palace of the Holy Ghost. You're not just some shanty shack over in the corner of glory you are a palace that's why the bible says know ye not that you are the temple of the holy ghost you are his temple you're his palace. you think he's going to live in some rundown shack no you are the palace of god and he loves every squinch every square inch of that palace inside of you he loves every bit of that palace he adores that palace. It's arrayed with gold. It's arrayed with silver. It's arrayed with diamonds. As a matter of fact, the Bible equates our vessel as being like gold and silver. Woo! It's a palace. Hallelujah. Several years ago, I, I didn't tell. I took uh, some Native Americans to Washington, D.C., God had given them, I was spending a couple of times a year out in Gallup, New Mexico with the Navajo Nation. And uh, some of you have heard me tell this, but God gave a word to them. First time that they were there, I was there, that they were to go to Washington, D.C. and release the awakening in this nation. The Navajos are the code talkers. They helped us win the war against Japan. Many of the men that were on this trip, there were 40 Native Americans. Many of them were descendants, sons of the code talkers. Every one of the code talkers, Navajo, became Marines. And they, but they protected them. When they were in battle, they had a protector that protected just them because they needed the code talkers to walk, I mean to talk on the walkie-talkies and release the Navajo language. And so I took them out there, and I took them because of the favor I had at the time. I don't have that favor in this administration, but in the administration that was there, or the Speaker of the House that was there then, John Boehner, we had favor with. And he allowed us to take this Navajo group of people into the Capitol, and they gave us a room about the size of this sanctuary. And for two hours... I watched these Navajo code talk to the Lord, weeping and crying as they were cleansing their palace, not the federal government. Here's what they were praying. They were asking God to forgive them for the offense that they held toward the American government and white people. All the broken trees. They were not asking forgiveness for the broken treaties. Federal government did that. They were asking forgiveness for their attitude and their unforgiveness toward the federal government. Here God put them in a place where in order them to connect with the Lord, they're going to have to forgive. I didn't see it at, at, the, at, at first. And then one of the Navajo came up to me. He's an apostle. He came up to me and says, he said, do you want to know what we're praying? He was weeping. I said, yeah. He said, we're asking God to forgive us for holding offense toward the federal government. Something broke that day, and we were able to go into Boehner's office, and 
I took five Navajo and four other people that were with me. And we went into Boehner's office. And Boehner's office is like a palace. Or the Speaker of the House office is like a palace. There's, in, in the crown molding, it's gold. It's not gold paint. It's gold. And I didn't tell the Navajo because their background is all about poverty. That's how they think. Any time, you need to grab this, any time a society of people moves into a welfare mindset to where they live off the government, poverty sets in. On the reservation, you go there and there was so much oppression, it would almost make you sick. Matter of fact, it did me one time. And you see the poverty. And, and the, among the people who do not work, the vast majority of them were in depression. Alcoholics, drug addicts, on meth, on peyote, all kind of other drugs. Incest was ab abounded there in the families there. Cheryl and I prayed and cast devils out of one girl who had been molested by her uncle. And, uh, <clears throat> but among the Native Americans that worked, they were happy and full of joy. They were not dependent on the government to make a way for them. As a matter of fact, if you're Native American and you go to work, you have to start paying for your, the welfare check goes away once you go to work. There's just something wrong with that. Because the Bible wants us to work. Wants us to make our own living. But I didn't tell the Na Native American about the inlay of the gold because I knew that it probably would offend them. But they did get out on the speaker's balcony. And they began to prophesy and pray in their Native American tongue, the Navajo tongue, co-talking with the Lord. Co-talking, decreeing that awakening has begun in America. I said all that to set you up to get you to begin seeing that you are the palace of the Lord. And within your soul, within your spirit, it's all laid out in gold and silver. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. We think that that's up in heaven. No, it's in the, within the kingdom. I've gone to prepare a kingdom realm for you. That's what he was saying. In my Father's house are many mansions. You're one of them. Come on now. See, we use that scripture to get raptured out of here. When God wants us to use it to apply to us today. In my Father's house are many mansions. There are many palaces. You're one, you're one, you're one, you're one, you're one. You're a palace unto the Lord. The DNA of Christ dwells in you. When, I, when we stayed in Trump hotel up in washington dc a few years ago everything is i don't know if it's all real gold or not but it's painted gold there's such an excellence on that place you feel the authority of the lord in the place you feel the authority that man carries you see this conference room over here is named Patton. this conference room over here is named general eisenhower or president eisenhower all of them signify an authority and dominion. When you walk into the Trump Hotel in D.C., and you go up to the front desk and you hand them your driver's license and they see your name every day. You walk by that front desk and they'll say, Mr. Malone, how are you doing? Do you need any help today? You know why? Because you're in a palace. And they've trained the people in the palace to treat you like someone who is a VIP. I will, Tangy. You walk up to the concierge. I don't know how they do this. Mr. Malone, you've not told him your name. Mr. Malone, how are you today? You come back the next day and you walk by the front desk and it's different people there. Mr. Malone, how are you this morning? Same thing is true when you sit in first class of the airplane. Do you want any crackers? Do you want any, any pretzels? What would you like to drink? We have Coke and... It's not the way it is in first class on the airplane. They walk up to you and they say, Mr. Malone, what would you like to have for breakfast this morning? 
What do you have? Well, we have eggs and bacon, or we have eggs and steak, or you can get cereal, or you can get oatmeal. If you can get eggs Benedict if you want that. And so it's a totally different way of living. Now, when we come into the family of God, we change DNAs. Now, we are a palace unto the Lord. So everything begins to change the way that we walk, the way that we talk, the way that we address things. Cheryl had to get me out of the flesh the other day when we were driving to Orlando to go get on the glory train because some people cut me off. She said, practice what you preach. <clears throat> All right, let's bring him back here. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. See, if the Holy Ghost is not talking to you, your wife will. And most of the times, they're saying what the Holy Ghost is saying, and you're not hearing. <laughs> so that DNA is a heavenly DNA. It's a, you have a, you're a palace on the inside. Now, really going to bring it home to you now. I, and you should, try to treat your palace with respect. Treat it with respect. Be nice to your palace. Be nice to that temple that the Lord lives in. Amen. Now, let's go home some more. Let's bring it home some more. You're to be nice to every palace that's around you. You're to treat them like royalty. Treat yourself like... This is what Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor can be actually your next door neighbor or someone you see in the grocery store or it can be someone that is part of the body. You treat every person like royalty. You see them, you go, ah, there's royalty. There's a VIP. And the Lord, I'm telling you, the Lord's really been chastening me to begin thinking differently. And I told you this last week, I have a bad habit, and I caught myself doing it on the glory train tour. And when someone comes up to talk to me, I'm out here in my vision. Because I'm vision driven. I want to see great awakening and revival come. I'm not talking about evangelists that blows in, blows up, and blows out. I'm not talking about a local church revival. I'm talking about God coming and setting on a city. That's why I did the glory train thing. That's why the people went with us. Because we want to see a great awakening and revival come to Florida. But at the same time, when a palace walks up to me and starts talking to me, I need to spend time inside that palace. I need to help adorn that palace. I need to be considerate of that palace. I need to love that palace instead of being off out in my vision. I was confessing my fault to Wendy, a spiritual daughter. We got to spend some time together. And on, on Thursday morning, we were down at breakfast, and I was telling her all the stuff that God's taken me through. And I was just telling her this about being all out in my vision. She said, you've done me that way. I said, yes, I have. And today I repent. And even while I was on the trip, I caught myself doing this. Even when Fran walked up to me tonight, and I was standing right here and started talking to me, I was already in the service. I was already right here where we are now. And all of a sudden, I caught myself and, and I said, pay attention to Fran. She's a palace. Whew. It is good. See, you may see yourself as a palace, but that other person, you see, see them as a shack. And you need to start seeing them as a palace as well. I haven't even gotten off the first page of my notes. This is so good. Woo! You see, you're, you're not a shack. You shouldn't treat your shit self like a shack. You shouldn't treat yourself like a shack. <laughs> Just keep on moving, okay? 
I don't know what you think I said, but I said you shouldn't treat yourself like a shack. I'll have to go back and listen to it because I didn't hear it. Because, see, I'm focused on you, see. I'm focused on you. I've said, I, whatever it was, I promise you, I've said a lot worse. What did I say? No, I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. See, I'm not convicted of that, so I'm just going to keep on going, okay? Because I didn't hear it. <laughs> but don't treat yourself and don't treat other people like a shack. Treat them like a palace. Because that's who you are. You're a palace unto the Lord. God, you're going to have to help me get this back. Everybody's smiling and looking at me. That was the corruptible seed, by the way. <laughs> All right, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, out of the Message Bible, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Whew. Wow. Garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. And this is one of the things the Lord showed me. Back, not this week, but the week before, when I had another visitation that went from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m., He began showing me the competitiveness I have as a minister. And how that many ministers are competitive in their walk with the Lord. And they operate from a competitive agenda. And then he started showing me how not only ministers, but believers walk in a stage of competitiveness. Of having agendas in their life to get their own way. There was a lot of things the, the, over those two nights. Cheryl was going to St. Petersburg. I'm glad she was because I stayed up a long time from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m on that actually Wednesday morning and then the next morning from 1 a.m. all the way past noon I was up when the Lord dealing with me about my competitive spiritual soulish realm not the Spirit of God but the soulish realm that seeks to have my own agenda and so I had to lay a lot of things down over those two days because of my competition, he goes, and that competition is cutthroat because you want your way. And you'll do anything you can to get your way. You'll backstab, you'll slit throats, you'll, you'll talk behind people's back just to get your way. All right. He goes on to say, all consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper and impotence to love or to be loved. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. And that's been me. And that's been you. That we bring people down into a rival. We compete against them. We compete in our intercession. We compete in our prophecy. We compete in our singing. We compete in our preaching. We compete in our walk. We, we vie for position. Who can get the closest to Pastor Kendall or, or, or Apostle Tangier or Apostle Ken? Let's compete for that. Let's show them what we can do. Come on, somebody. I'm telling the truth. We don't want to admit it, but we've been in a competition. And a lopsided pursuit. It's the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncon and, and see, we're not rivals. But boy, the enemy would love for us to be that way. See, that's why Psalms 1, we've missed Psalms 133 for years. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in unity. And the focus in that sentence is not on unity. The focus in that sentence is dwell. 
Dwell is a verb. Unity is a noun. And you can't do a noun, but you do a verb. So he's saying there, you've got to learn how to dwell. I need to bring my palace alongside your palace, and our palaces need to make a neighborhood for the kingdom of God. And not just uh, compete against who has the prettiest palace. Back, you've heard me talk about it, and I've got a newspaper article in my office over there when Cheryl and I won the Jeep Liberty that God gave us to do the... the uh, US One Liberty Prayer Tour with, I had a number of people tell me, you don't deserve this. You don't need a car. I need a car. You don't need one. I said it didn't have anything to do with need. Matter of fact, I wasn't praying for it. Our bank was giving away five of them. I put my name in the basket three times. And the next thing I know, she's calling me on the phone. And giving me a brand new Jeep Liberty that I didn't pay for. That's when God really gives you a car. When you make payments on it, that good job you have that God gave you is getting that car for you. But I had people that were so envious and jealous over Cheryl and I getting that car. Getting that Jeep. I found out what Jesus said to be very true. And when you give up lands and houses and things in, the, in, in this life, that in this life also you will inherit 100-fold, he said, houses, lands, property, with persecution, he said. And I found out what that was like. So let's just say, we're going to really get nitty-gritty now. Let's just say Tangie stumbles on about $5 million given to her. Well, after she ties on it, I think what you ought to do is build the house of your dreams. And it should be the biggest house that you want. It should be fixed out just like you want. And all of you other palaces need to ooh and ah and say, this is so awesome. I'm so glad you won that $5 million or whatever. You know, I know she doesn't play the lottery. At least I don't think you do. But, uh, <laughs> but we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be jealous to the point where we would despise what God has done for someone else. We should rejoice when someone's receiving. I know I had a few people when we moved here and we got a place over on the beach. They said, hmm. That's all they said. Hmm. It is terrible. You know, and I didn't really want to do that. Next thing I know, my wife, we're over here in the Hilton Hotel. We've already planned to come here, and we're going shopping with a realtor one morning. She's already got with that realtor, and the only houses they're looking at are on the beach. And I said, Cheryl, we can't do this. There's no way we're going to do this. And so I don't forget how, I think it's when I got in the car and found out about this and was kind of just huffed up and puffed up, you know, and, thinking to myself, we can't do this, that the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to do this for your wife. Wow. And so we did. Hmm. We don't live there now, and the only reason we don't live there is because God directed us after four years to move inland. And, uh, and I wish he had directed me about two years ago to move inland because I've had to spend a lot of money on my truck because of all the rust that was underneath. Just remember, when you go to the beach, unless your car is garage, hers was garage, my truck, I've had it painted twice. I just spent $6,000 on it doing the undercarriage and the transmission where it had rusted out. So there's a price to pay over there as well. Mine was my truck. Hmm. <laughs> Glory to God. See, we, it goes on to say, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ungodly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the works of the corruptible seed passed down through your family from the family of Adam. But we have come into a new family. 
Here are the works of the incorruptible sea. And I'll bring this to one of my many closings. It says in, in Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. He's saying this is the fruit of people who walk in the Spirit. This is how they act. They're very patient. They stop and they listen to people. See, I don't... I, that's a bad habit I have. I'm off out there in my vision. Somebody's talking to me. The chief justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama was talking to me in Washington, D.C. at Trump's inauguration. And he's from Alabama. I am too. I've gotten rid of some of my accent. But he's talking like this. Brother Ken, it's so good to see you. Let me tell you what God is doing in Alabama. And I'm off out here in my vision. I know this is going to take a long time. And I'm, I'm standing there listening to him. And I'm off out in my vision. And the Holy Spirit says to me, listen. And I listen for a few seconds and I'm off out there again. And the Holy Spirit says to me, you need to stop and listen to what this man has to say. This man really, really loves God. Uh, just as Tom Parker in Alabama loves God tremendously and um, we need to walk in that fruit of the spirit well, that is the agape it's the agape spirit is love the fruit of the spirit is agape the God kind of love now I'm going to read this to you now to the passion translation but the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions. Joy that overflows. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A life full of virtue. Faith that prevails. Gentleness of heart. And strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities. For they are meant to be limitless. Keep in mind that we who belong to Jesus Christ have already experienced crucifixion. For everything connected with our self-life was put to death on the cross and crucified with Messiah. If the Spirit is the source of our life, we must also allow the Spirit to direct every aspect of our lives so we may never be arrogant or look down on another, for each of us is an original. We must forsake all jealousy that diminishes the value of others. And that's out of the Passion Translation. The big thing that God's been bringing home to me is if we're going to walk in this supernatural love, we have got to begin to value one another and begin to treat each person like a palace. Don't treat, treat them like a shack. I'm going to try to be careful now, okay? Don't treat them like a shack. Treat them like a palace. You're a palace. Treat yourself like a palace. All right? I was going to get into 1 Corinthians 13, but uh, it's too much, it's, I got too much to say, and I will get into that next week.